this yeah i have a few copies of this because um yeah the the term independent filmmaking has changed quite a bit since the early 70s when he made that book uh because we've had an, an american independent film movement for instance and by the 90s this became like indie film and that's almost like uh just a genre now even when the film might cost millions and millions of dollars but it still can be called an indie film <laughs> Like, I mean, uh, an obvious example might be Clerks, the Kevin Smith film, and it's a film where there's just a lot of people talking about not much. And it's uh, shot in a very simple way with black and white. And yeah, I think the economics are really the biggest part for me because it doesn't just mean the money, I think. It means who's given you the money and what you owe that person by making your film. Because if you, like I've talked to filmmakers who they were given money to make a film, and even though they had total control, more or less, there was still some aspect of the filmmaking process that had to satisfy that funder. And usually that's that the funder didn't want to lose money. Because I, I do know that, for instance, in the U.S., it's it, almost pretty much impossible to get government money for filmmaking. And I know in Europe, there are, at least in a lot of European countries, there are at least some opportunity to get some money. Europe has a, a tradition of, of, the, of the government recognizing the culture of something to be protected. I mean, the, the history of, of, of art as, a, as, a, as, a, as an event that challenges us and makes us engage and think and, you know, changes our perspective. Um, I mean, this is something that's actively fought against um, by, by the consumer model of, of, of cinema, particularly in America, is that the, the idea of changing perspective is dangerous. It is, it is very difficult to get certain movies financed unless, I mean, because they're dark, because they're challenging, you know, and we're looking just for, I mean, that, that somebody would say that the reason why your film isn't going to be financed is because it's challenging, mm -hmm. is something you're not going to hear from any, gov any government in that, that, that believes that culture is, is something to be protected. I think that any movie that feels like a crisis is productive. It's uh, a safe place to, to you know, experience hell. Yeah, absolutely. There needs to be an expression of joy. But if there's only an expression of joy, what happens then? When I'm watching a movie and I, and I feel that the author is talking to me and they're telling me a message, it feels obscene. It feels like a kind of propagandistic deception rather than that it's an experience. And the muddy, all of the muddied space of reality is sort of lost then. And that's really a constructive playground, you know? One very, very small consolation of this like kind of nightmarish uh, election that the U.S. just had is that hopefully, I think, there'll be a lot of really amazing, radicalized, um, passionate art being made, including films, in response to this. And so it actually, at least looking at it very microscopically at that one thing, uh, it might prove to be a quite interesting four years. <laughs> I take a lot of heat where I say, guns, you gotta have them. I'm a big, big, big Second Amendment person. Big, big. It has become for so many Americans something that's so important, that's so related to their national mm -hmm. uh, thing and cannot be taken away, okay. even though there are a lot of arguments uh, against it. The whole thing of the guy, of people carrying guns, come from, comes from the, the archetype of the cowboy, the mm. westerner. Mm. And that is so ingrained in American society. Mm. It, um, it's, it's all fiction because the Second Amendment, uh, the right to, to own guns in America, um, I cannot imagine popular culture existing without it because in every film you see there's a gun. In every film you've ever seen, there's a gun or some sort of weapon or a gun being used. Mm. So that's the dilemma, because if you love the movies and if you love popular culture, you, you have to love gunplay. All right, boys. and the contestants, you know, a round of applause for nerves. Because with your vicious mother it do take nerves. What you feel, what you 
Well, you know, you, just like in Paris is Burning, the film, you see and they talk about how, you know, it was minorities, uh, first of all, gay, second, black or Latino. Um, they didn't have a lot of opportunities. So they always, they glorified this American dream of the big house and the cars and, and the fur coats and the fashion and the uh, fame and glamour. Um, they created a whole fantasy world that was inspired by this. With the addition of my signature today, PFAT becomes a reality. When at last the world population can rise as one and say, Anthony? Oh my god. Step back. Stay in close there. Take a left. I got it. Anthony. Popular culture is not prepared for Hillary Clinton, and popular culture has not prepared us for Hillary yeah, Clinton. Right. And Hillary Clinton does something that is non-traditional for a woman, and um, but she also has to be liked to be elected. So you really see how she has to, you know, like smile a lot and and um, not gesture uh, gesture as much as she would like to, and she can't sound too angry or people will be scared. We popular culture has really trained us to um, to be very tolerant of of flawed male characters, mm. flawed male leaders. I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just like, I don't even know where. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. <laughs> I can do anything. Quite often when we think about the history of blackface, we immediately think of the American blackface minstrel of the 19th century, which depicted Africans and African Americans on stage accompanied by music. This is how the average person got to know about enslaved people's everyday lives. However, these shows made a mockery of the very humanity of people of African descent. Black lives on screen is more than mere entertainment. It's a reflection of reality. And whose reality we're talking about is a very important matter indeed. D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation was released in 1915. In the film, black characters are seen preventing whites from voting and also exhibiting antisocial behaviour in public. When one of the characters, a white actor in blackface, attempts to rape a white female character, he's hunted down by the KKK and lynched. This film basically promoted the idea that black people cannot have equal rights because we'll take over society and begin brutalizing white folks. As a consequence, the release of Birth of a Nature, which was a Hollywood smash, actually led to an increase in lynching for the most trivial of actions. It was basically a way for whites to keep blacks in their place after slavery. <laughs> Eén woord zoek ik voor mijn ultieme ik ben. Eén woord waarin ik mezelf herken. Ben ik een neger? Ben ik een neger? Ik, ik kijk wel eens naar mijn arm en dan denk ik... 
Is dit de arm van een neger? Negertje, noemde mijn pleegvader me. En dan viel ik in slaap op zijn schoot. Hij wilde me behoeden, zodat ik de woede met liefde zou beantwoorden. Neger klinkt niet zo knus als borrelnootje. Het heeft de sfeer van rollende ogen, roetmoepen en roeien in het veronder. Wie is de neger? Wie is de neger? De ik ben is een beperking. Iemand plakt je op het raam, iemand zet jou in de hoek en jij gaat er braaf zitten tekenen. Braaf zijn is vooral handig voor anderen. Is neger zijn ook vooral handig voor anderen? <tied>